in my heart, I am personally greeting each and every one of you individually. But for scheduling purposes, my body's sitting here. We are very grateful to each and every one of you for being with us today. Special gratitude to His Holiness Chandri, Chandramali Swami Maharaj, <coughs> His Holiness Varaha Swami Maharaj, Adiós. His Grace Shesha Prabhu, Adiós. Her Grace Bandakini Mataji, Adiós. Her Grace Narataki Mataji, Adiós. Her Grace Kamagiri Mataji. Adiós. To two dear friends, Jules and Hachi, Arrivo. and to all of you. Srila Rupa Goswami tells us in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. that one of the five most important practices of bhakti is to go to holy places of pilgrimage. Could everyone hear? Could you hear? there's any difficulty in hearing, please report it to the sound system people. I don't know who they are or where they are. It is said that if we go to a holy place to bathe in the holy rivers and see the spots without satsang, associating and hearing from holy people, then it is not really a pilgrimage at all. In Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita it is said on many occasions that those people who carry Krishna or the Supreme Lord within their hearts, all the holy places are present there. So when we come to a holy place in the association of devotees who are like-minded, who share the same essential purpose, and we come to hear about the Lord and his devotees, to chant the holy names in kirtan and japa, to offer our prayers, then it truly is a place of pilgrimage. And Krishna reveals himself to us in such an atmosphere. On the path of bhakti, we pray for pure devotional service. Anya bilashita sunyam. Rupa Goswami tells us that pure bhakti is uncompromised by the desire for liberation, by the desire for mystic powers, 
by the desire for heavenly pleasures, pure devotional service is simply to awaken our love with a will to serve with love. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when describing bhakti to Sanatana Goswami, he built his most incredible teachings on the foundation of a single verse. Jivera Swarupoy Krishnera Nityadas that we are all eternally the servants of Krishna. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Shravanadidu that within the heart of every living being is love for Krishna. And by associating with Krishna's devotees, chanting Krishna's names, practicing the principles of devotional service, that love is awakened. Natanamna Janamna Sundarim Kavitam Vajakadisha Kamaye Mama Janmani Janmani Shwari Bhavatar Bhakti Rohaita Kitwai Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught us this prayer. I do not want the pleasures of this world, wealth, sexual pleasures, sensual pleasures. I do not want the prestige and fame of being great or learned or advanced spiritually. I do not want the mystic powers that people spend lifetimes trying to achieve. I do not even want liberation from birth and death. My only prayer is to serve you unconditionally with love forever. That is the aspiration of those who follow the path of bhakti as it has been handed down by great acharyas from the very beginning of creation. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, Prahlad Maharaj tells there are nine processes within this bhakti path. Saravana kirtana smarana bandana pada sevana dasyade pujana sakijana atmani vedana. Beginning with hearing about the Lord and chanting his holy names and always remembering him. Each of these paths of bhakti is especially personified by a particular person. Mahajano ye nagatasa panda. The path of perfection is to follow in the footsteps of great souls. Parikshit Maharaj attained perfection simply by hearing about Krishna and his various avatars and his teachings. Shukadev Goswami attain perfection simply by kirtanam, by chanting and describing the Lord's names and glories. Little Prahlad, by always remembering Krishna in any and every situation. Kunti Devi, the great queen and mother of the Pandavas, in the spirit of Prahlad, she prayed to Krishna, let challenges and difficulties come upon me. Because in that situation, I'm helpless. And I have no one else to turn to. And I remember you with a whole heart. And in remembering you, I am taken beyond danger and beyond fear. Devotees of the Lord understand this principle, that this material world has been created 
to facilitate every living being to ultimately attain his or her own spiritual perfection. If it wasn't for time and getting old and the threefold miseries, adhyatmaka, adhibhotika, adhidaivaka, miseries caused by our own body and mind, miseries caused by other people or other beings, miseries caused by natural disturbances, then we would be complacent to just be happy in this world. But the eternal soul is such an ananda. It is eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. And the ananda, the bliss of the soul, is to feel the unlimited love of Bhagavan or Krishna and to love Krishna. That exchange of love is the only true happiness for the eternal soul. When we see the soul from the perspective of eternity, then the situations that come in this tiny little flash of a lifetime can be seen in its proper perspective. Sometimes we see our troubles being so um, so difficult. Why? Why is this happening? But when we see from the perspective of eternity, which is our true nature, we understand that whatever troubles are there ultimately are there to help us to reconnect with our true essence, with Krishna. Hanuman is the personification of Seva. He perfected his life through selfless service to Sri Ram. It is seen that practically all the various spiritual paths of India unanimously have great honor for Hanumanji. Whether you go to Kashi or Brindavan or any holy place, where you go to any temple for any of the various of, of the supreme absolute truth or the devas, Hanuman is always there to welcome us. Even the Jains and the Buddhists in various places worship Hanuman. His universal um, attraction is based on his incredible, unique, unconditional loving service to Sri Ram and his compassion. When Sita was abducted and separated from Ram by Ravana, here in Kishkindakshetra, where we sit, Ram manifested his deep feelings of viraha bhava, or separation. We will all go to a place in Ramayana, it is called Prashravana. It is also known as Malyavanta. There is a mountain close to where we sit where there is a cave. After Ram made alliance with Sugriva, the monsoon rain started pouring down. It was pouring so 
hard. It was impossible to search for Sita at that time. So Ram, who was playing the role of a human, he told Sugriva and his prime minister, Hanuman, that after the monsoons, we will search for Sita. For that four months, Ramchandra and his brother Lakshman remained in that cave. 24 hours a day, day after day, week after week, month after month, Lord Sri Ram was totally immersed in separation from Sita. There is a murti of Lord Ramchandra sitting in a lotus posture with beads in his right hand and with his left touching his heart. Because there, throughout the day, he was chanting the names of Sita and meditating upon her within his heart. And far away, in the distant land of Sri Lanka, in the Ashok Grove, Sita, being harassed, tormented by Ravana and the Rakshashas and Rakshashis, was chanting Ram's name constantly, meditating on Ram within the core of her heart. In this way, the deepest union of love was manifested in their separation from each other. When Krishna left Vrindavan to Mathura and later to Dwarka, Brihad Bhagavatamrita by Sanatan Goswami, it is explained how the gopis and the gopas, they lived 24 hours a day, only breathing with the expectation that well, Krishna will return that day. The gopis cried for the rest of their lives in separation from Krishna. They would make garlands for him make wonderful arrangements in every way, cook his favorite foods, expecting him to return that day. In Chaitanya Charitamrita, during the Ratha Yatra, it is explained Lord Chaitanya's mood of Sri Radha in separation from Krishna and Krishna's mood in separation from Vrijbhasis. Krishna revealed that all day, every day, he is simply remembering the residents of Vrindavan. And the residents of Vrindavan always immersed in remembering him. Sanatana Goswami reveals Krishna's mind that the depth of the love in separation is so deep, the union of their hearts, that it's the highest revelation of Prem. In a similar way, Ram and Sita were experiencing that Viraha Bhav. And Kishkindakshetra, where we sit today, is very much personifying that revelation. It is here that Ram cried for four months in separation from his Sita. The ultimate beloved. The jiva, every living being who is part and parcel of the Supreme Lord, has an, as its deepest potential and its very essence, 
love for Krishna, love for Ram. That love, that prem, is the energy, part and parcel of Sri Radha or Sri Sita's love. But due to the ego, the ahankar, the misconception that I am this body and all of its designations and whatever is in relationship to this body is mine, we have forgotten that love. We are constantly being distracted by those things that perpetuate this material conception of life. Bhakti is the process of reconnecting us to our true nature, and in doing so, reconnecting us in our relationship with the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna. In this sense, Sita represents love of Krishna, love of Ram. The jiva, the soul's love for God. The atma. Ram is the paramatma. Ravana is the ahankar. Ravana is that power that separates our love for the supreme. Bhakti is what reconnects us with the Supreme. It was Hanuman that delivered the message to Sita after discovering her, that delivered, that delivered Sita's message back to Ram. It was Hanuman who was prominent in building the bridge across the ocean to reconnect Ram and Sita. It was Hanumanji who was the most instrumental person to fight the battle against the Rakshashas and assist Ram in overcoming Ravana. And it was Hanuman who was sent by Ram after the great war of Sri Lanka to bring Sita back, to be reunited with him. Hanuman, all of the incredible pastimes that he performed. He never took credit for anything. He was constantly chanting the holy names of the Lord and he gave all credit to God's grace who was always present within the holy names. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. Please chant much louder. of Krishna's names, of Ram's names, wakes us up. <laughs> and because in this age of Kali, people are so soundly sleeping, <laughs> the loud chanting of the holy names is required. place we are sitting is a very ancient holy place. There is 
many, many histories to explain. I will speak just a few. We read in Srimad Bhagavatam and other Puranas about the Daksha Yajna. Daksha, he was such an extraordinary person. His physical beauty was incomparable. His knowledge of scriptures and every other science and subject matter was incredible. He had such power, such fame. When he came into an assembly, the rishis, the sages, and even the devas would stand up to greet him. But despite having all these qualities, he had a great disqualification, which is the basic anartha or unwanted quality that separates everyone from the Supreme, from Krishna. And that is ahankar or ego. As soon as we think anything we have is our own, we fall into illusion. Prakrite kriyamanani gunai karmani sarvasha. Ahankara, Krishna tells in Gita. Bewildered souls think themselves to be the doers of their activities. But actually, everything we have is a gift. To have a grateful heart is to be humble and acknowledge the power of the persons who are giving us these gifts. Without air, we cannot breathe. We cannot digest our food. We cannot live for more than a few minutes. Vayu is the Lord of the air, who on behalf of the Supreme Bhagavan is providing. Where there is ego, the natural Evolution is it creates envy. We want to be great, we want to be the proprietor, we want to be the enjoyer. Daksha, who had so much, was envious of his own son in law, Shiva. And due to that envy, he said so many terrible things against Shiva. And it's a beautiful and incredible story, but eventually Shiva's own wife, Sati, ended her life because she could not tolerate it. She took her next birth. One of her names was Pampa Devi. And she came to this place to perform tapasya, to get Shiva as her husband. And Shiva also was here doing tapasya to once again get Sati as his wife. While he was engrossed in tapasya and deep, deep meditation, the Asuras were attacking the devas. So the devas wanted to wake up Shiva because they needed a son from him to be their general. But Shiva was in such deep samadhi that nothing could wake him. So the devas appointed Kamadev, who is the predominating personality, the power 
over the desire to enjoy karma. So he came and created such an unbelievable environment. It was right here, where we are close to. He created the most pleasing season, weather. There were flowers with magnificent fragrances blooming. Everything was just so nice. And he created amazing apsaras or dancing ladies singing with celestial voices and dancing around Lord Shiva. And he just sat in meditation. Nothing fazed him. Every single material power that Kamadev had, he used. And Shiva was not to be disturbed. So finally, he took his own arrow with all of his potencies and directed it toward Shankar. Lord Shiva opened his eyes and when he saw Kamadev there, he opened a third eye <laughs> and Kamadev was burned to ashes. The place where that happened is Man, Manmat. It's a kund, very close to here. It represents Param Dristva Nivartate. If we want to overcome the desires, the distractions, that are so powerful and beyond us. Krishna tells in Gita that this material nature consisting of goodness, passion, and ignorance, Rajaguna, Tamaguna, Sattvaguna, is very difficult to overcome. But one who takes shelter of me can experience the higher taste, the higher experience of my grace. And only then can we overcome the challenges and the distractions of material life. The devas explain the reasons in Shiva um, in this place. He pardoned Kamadev and gave him a body without a body, Ananga. And then he came together with Pampa Devi, who is also part of, another name is Parvati. So on the Virupaksha temple, we find the Murti of Pampa Devi and the Murti of Lord Shiva. It is here that they perform tapasya to be reunited with each other. It was here that they were reunited. Hampi is famous throughout the world for many reasons. Many, many people come here. Some because it's one of the most beautiful, natural places of scenery with its rivers and mountains and rock formations. Others come here because some of the most important historical ancient ruins are here. Around the year of 1336, the Vijayanagar Empire was established. At the time, the Mughals 
were conquering all of North India and conquering so much of South India. And there were various South Indian Hindu kingdoms that were fighting, but ultimately they were losing. So the kings came together as one kingdom. The Vijayanagar. Vijaya Could everyone hear? Adi Adi. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada gave, it sounds different. <laughs> Can you hear, Jules? The Prabhupada gave example that when we are united through cooperation, we could stand together to, with, to overcome great challenges. Maya is extremely strong. Srila Prabhupada gave example that if you take little sticks and bind them together, then the unity is their strength. It cannot be broken. But if you take each stick out, it can easily be broken. So when we are united for that common higher purpose of devotional service, it gives us great strength. So cooperation, respect among each other, is not just a cultural um, expression, but it's actually a need for our spiritual survival. So these various kingdoms were brought together by the kings of Vijayanagar, and ultimately they ruled over practically the whole of South India for about 250 years. And all the various religions and all the various cultures lived happily together here under the higher... <laughs> Nobody could hear. Hare Krishna, can you hear now? Hare Bola, no sound the same from where I'm sitting. Vishaka Priya, can you hear? Okay. Of the great architectural achievements after over two centuries were quite destroyed when they were conquered. But the ruins have become one of the very ar archaeologically most um, attractive places in the world. So you'll see some of these places. But that's not why we came here. <laughs> so now I will begin my talk. So many great Acharyas came here not to see archaeological ruins. <laughs> Ramanujacharya came here, Shankaracharya came here, Balabhacharya came here. Madhvacharya, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Nityananda Prabhu. It describes in our great histories, they all came to receive blessings in this place. 
and to teach us the importance of coming to these places on pilgrimage. In Sri Ramayan, this is Kishkinda Kshetra. And it is especially a place where people come and where we have come to offer our prayers to Sri Hanuman. Sri Ramchandra appears in this world in Treta Yuga in various kalpas. And Hanuman, his eternal servant, comes with him. So in the different Puranas, it describes different ways in which Sri Hanumanji took his birth within this world. I'd like to speak just a few of them. In the Ananda Ramayan, it explains how Bhumi Devi and the various devas approached Brahma because Ravana and his associates were terrorizing the world. And Lord Vishnu was worshipped by them and he promised to appear. He told the, de the demigods, the devas, to appear within the Vanara community among celestial monkeys and how he would appear as the son of Dasarat and Kosalya. King Dasarat was the emperor of the Koshal dynasty whose capital was Ayodhya. Valmiki explains in his Ramayan that Ayodhya was full of all prosperity. Everyone treated each other with love and respect. There was no poverty, there was no hunger, there was no thirst, there were no sufferings. Everything was just so nice. Dasarat, although having everything and being so incredibly popular, loved and successful, could not find any true happiness because he wanted a son. when he retired to dedicate his entirety of life to the service of the Supreme Lord, he could entrust the responsibilities of a kingdom to his son. Years passed, and ultimately, he performed on the instruction of Vashishta Muni a special yagya. The head priest was Rishyashringa. And the culmination of that yagya was the chanting of a mantra, an oblation. From that oblation in the sacred fire, a divine personality emerged. He was holding a golden pot of celestial piasm or nectar. He gave that to Dasarat and told him to share it among his three wives. Kosalya, Kaikeyi, and Sumitra. We know from Ramayan after the three of them drank that piasum, they became pregnant. Ram, Lakshman, Bharat, and Sutrugna were to be born. 
as that divine person gave a portion to Sumitra, Vayu appeared. Vayu is the lord of the air, the lord of the wind. He came in the form of a huge bird. He came down and took a portion of that piasm and flew into the air to hear. And there, Anjana, the wife of Keshuri, she had worshipped Lord Shiva for a son. And Lord Shiva appeared to her and told her, you perform tapasya and hold your palms out. <laughs> Vayu put the piasam in Anjana's hands and she drank it and became pregnant. And after some time, Hanuman was born. In the Shiva Purana, there is another story. We read in Srimad Bhagavatam also of how the devas and the asuras churn the ocean of milk for the purpose of getting nectar, amrit. Danvantari appeared at the very conclusion of this incredible pastime with this pot of nectar. And the demigods and the demons were fighting over it, and ultimately the demons snatched it. The devas were in a completely helpless state. So they prayed to Lord Vishnu, and Lord Vishnu appeared as the most beautiful woman anyone could imagine. Her name was Mohini. And she went right before the demons, the asuras, and glanced at them. And each of them was thinking, she loves me. <laughs> and she spoke so sweetly. And each of them surrendered to her because they thought she loves only me. And they said, you know, there's a dispute because what happened is after the, demi, after the asuras took all the nectar, they were fighting over who were to take it first. They wouldn't let any of each other take it. Even if they were going to share it, each one thought, I should have the honors of having it first. So as the asuras were fighting over it, the demigods were just sitting there completely bereft, and Mohini appeared. And all the demigods, they said, Mohini, you take this whole pot of nectar, and you distribute it as you want. And each one was convinced she's going to give it to me only. Such was her beauty. She took it and gave it all to the demigods. <laughs> so Lord Shiva met Lord Vishnu, and he said, I heard about this Mohini Murti. I want to see this form. Lord Vishnu said, I don't think you want to see this form. He said, no, no, I want to see this form. So then Lord Vishnu said, all right, and he left. And Lord Shiva was sitting, and suddenly Mohini Murti appeared. And she was playing with a ball. And she was so beautiful. Lord Shiva was so attracted to her. And he started running to catch her. And she was running away. But she was running in such a way that she didn't even seem to be running. She would just glance at him and then look somewhere else and glance at <laughs> him. Parvati was sitting next to Shiva, and he, 
and he left Parvati. And as Mohini, she ran to these to a hermitage where Shiva's devotees who were all sadhus and babas performing severe austerities. They were brahmacharis, they were sannyasis, they were doing all this to worship Shiva. And they're all chanting his names and performing yagyas. And suddenly the most most beautiful woman comes running right through their hermitage and they all look down and turn their heads away because <laughs> they didn't want to displease Lord Shiva by looking at her. But then the next thing that happened is they saw Lord Shiva. <laughs> and he was running after her and they didn't know what to do. And ultimately, Lord, she, she came to a special place and she allowed Lord Shiva to touch her. Then she disappeared. And when he touched her, his potency, his seed came out from his body. The power of Lord Shiva was there. Lord Shiva's own identity was in that seed. And that was entrusted to the Saptarishis, the seven great sages. Lord Shiva explained to them, you should take this and give it to Vayu. Lord Vayu, he took that seed and brought it to Anjana. Lord Shiva's potency and identity was in that seed. And Vayu, in, he invested his own personality and his own potencies within that seed. And Vayu, as the wind, placed it within Anjana through her ear, different explanations, and Hanuman was born. It is explained that when Ravana was conquering the world and creating so much crying, Ravana means one who makes people cry. The demigods appeal to Vishnu. But Ravana, so many of his powers he got from the benedictions of Brahma and also benedictions of Shiva. At Gokarna, Ravana performed severe tapasya. And Lord Shiva gave him so many benedictions. So Lord Vishnu did not want to kill a devotee of Shiva. And Shiva did not want to kill his own devotee. But Ravana, after getting these powers, became so arrogant. He thought he could do anything. He was committing so many offenses. It was decided he must be killed. So Lord Shiva, he told Vishnu and the devas that he is my devotee. And I manifest myself as 11 rudras. In his tapasya, he cut off ten of his heads to pacify me and get my favor. But not an eleventh. So I will manifest myself, expand myself as the eleventh Rudra, Sri Hanumanji. 
and assist you to liberate the world from Ravana. So one day Shiva was immersed in great emotion and chanting the names of Ram. And Parvati asked him, why are you doing like this? And Lord Shiva told Parvati Devi that the name of Ram is the, the complete presence of the absolute truth, the supreme Lord of all creation is within the name. And that same Ram is going to appear within the world to satisfy the devas by liberating Ravana. And I want to come. I'm going to incarnate in the world to serve Ram, my beloved eternal master, in the form of a monkey. She said, why do you want to come in the form of a monkey? I said, because monkeys are completely detached. <laughs> and they have no caste. They can do anything. Nothing will obstruct my, my service to Ram in this form. Actually, I will come become Hanuman. Hanuman is an umsa, a plenary portion of me. And Parvati said, I want to come with you. I want to assist you. I will come as your tail. Because just like I am your ornament as your wife, the tail is the ornament of a monkey. <laughs> the most beautiful tail, which may be full of all of your potencies. So Lord Shiva agreed. It is described in Valmiki Ramayan that in the heavenly worlds there was an Apsara named Punji Kastala. And when she was a young child, Brihaspati, the guru for all the demigods, brought her to his own ashram and accepted her as his own daughter in the forest of the hermitage where they lived. It was the abode of peace, where all of these great sages and rishis who were living with Brihaspati, the topmost of all Brahmins, were absorbed in puja and yajna and meditation and chanting the holy names of the Lord. Punji Kastala was brought up from her early childhood in that environment. She didn't know anything about material desires because they just didn't exist there. When she was about 17 years old, she was collecting flag fragrant flowers to bring back to Brihaspati, her guru, who was like her own father. And she, she came out of the boundaries of the ashram, unknowingly. And there she wandered to a place where there were some Gandharvas, very heavenly people, and they were taking their baths. And they were enjoying so many materialistic ways. And she became attracted. Brihaspati was waiting for her and waiting for her. Finally, he came out and saw her and understood the situation. And he told her, because you still have these material desires and you want to enjoy independently, let you be free from these desires. You will be born in the earth in a family of monkeys. She became very sober after hearing this. Punjikastala 
and fell at the feet of Brihaspati and begged, why are you giving me this curse? He said, it's not a curse, it's a blessing. There's a purpose behind it. Vayu and Shiva will incarnate as your son, Hanuman. He will be the greatest of the devotees, the very symbol of bhakti. After you give birth to him, then you could return to your place here, completely liberated and free. So Punji Kastala took birth as the daughter of Kunjara, who was the chief of the Vanaras, or the monkey tribe, and her name was Anjana. Anjana had such divine qualities. When she was young, she just wanted to, she just wanted to love God. <laughs> and she had this innate desire for a child also, which was the will of the Lord. She went into the forest just to be undisturbed in her devotion. At that time, there was a rakshasha, Shamba Sadhana, and he saw her and fell in love with her. I wanted to enjoy her. She ran away, but he chased after her. Eventually she ran to a place of great sages and rishis in a hermitage and expressed her condition. And they said, this Shamba Sadhana is such a powerful rakshasha, such an asura that he's constantly harassing us and there's nothing we could do about it. But there is one great Vanara monkey warrior named Keshari, and he is the one who can slay him. Shambhasadana, he attacked the hermitage, started destroying everything that the sages were doing, and went to abduct Anjana. She prayed to Lord Shiva to save her. At that time, Keshari, he appeared. And he challenged Shambhasadana. It was an incredible fight. They were battling one another Shambhasadana, by his mystic powers, became a gigantic elephant. And he was destroying everything in sight. And Keshari, there was nothing he could do to stop him. So ultimately, he took a small form and jumped right on the forehead, which is the weakest part of the elephant, and started beating on him and beating on him. And he was so small, but his fists were so strong, and the elephant couldn't do anything because he couldn't reach him. <laughs> and eventually, he had to give up the form of an elephant and became the Rakshasha again. And they were fighting and fighting and fighting, and neither one could defeat the other. Meanwhile, Anjana was praying to Shiva, and Shiva appeared to her and said, the only way this Rakshasha could be killed is through his own blood. So she used her imagination, and she saw some of his blood that was spilled, and she took an arrow and covered it with that blood and she gave it to Keshari and said, shoot this into the Rakshasha. <laughs> he shouted. 
and the Rakshasha died. So all the rishis and sages were coming to Keshuri and congratulating him, and he said, it's actually, it's Anjana. She's the one who taught me how to do it. Otherwise, I couldn't have done it. So they were expressing their gratitude. And the sages requested Anjana and Keshuri to marry. So they married. And many years passed. And although they both wanted a child, it was an innate desire that God has put in their hearts, no child was born. So they prayed. And they both did tapasya for years and years. And at one time, Lord Shiva and Parvati, they took the form of a male and female monkey. And Keshri wanted to chase them away, but Anjana said, no, no, no. That is Shiva and Parvati, I know. And after honoring them, they heard a voice. This is another story. And they were blessed. Ultimately, the seed that was given, well, in this particular story, Shiva tells that in the forest there's an incredible mango tree. And a particular mango from that tree will give you the child that you pray for. So they went into the forest and found this mango tree and performed prayers and tapasya and worship. And after seven days, a divine personality appeared from the tree with a beautiful effulgent mango. And he said, I am Vayu. Within this mango is the potency of Shiva, and I have put my own potency in this. He gave it to Keshri to give to Anjana. Keshri put all of his potencies in that mango. And Anjana ate it and became pregnant with a child. It was here, in Anjana Paravat, that Anjana gave birth to Hanuman. He is the son of Vayu. He is the son of Shiva. He is the son of Keshari and the son of Anjana, Anjaneya. It is described while he was in the womb of his mother, Bali, who was the king of the Vanaras, unrivaled. He had heard that the child within Anjana's womb was going to be extremely powerful. So he was insecure, thinking, if he's so extremely powerful, he may conquer me. So he took a particular weapon, a subtle weapon, made out of five metals, gold, silver, copper, tin, iron. And he sent that weapon into the womb of Anjana to kill the baby. But because he had the power of Shiva and Vayu. The weapon melted. 
and formed into gold earrings <laughs> that Hanuman put on his ears. So when Hanuman was born, he had these beautiful earrings, but nobody could see them because they were divine. He was also born with a crown and with jewels and with a saffron cloth covering himself. <laughs> when he was a little baby, just an infant baby, he was so beautiful. And Anjana didn't even want to go back to the heavenly worlds because she had this most wonderful son. So she remained as his mother. They were so proud. One day, little Hanuman, very small child, famous story, he was hungry. <laughs> and his mother was not present at the time. The sun was rising, and he saw the sun to be a piece of fruit. So he jumped to eat the fruit. Little baby Hanuman was jumping, and he was soaring through the air and going through outer space toward the sun. And when he was just about to approach the sun, Surya, who was the sun himself, he understood the greatness of Hanuman, so he was, he was recognizing that. And Vayu, the, son, the father of Hanuman, was protecting little Hanuman with air to make sure that Hanuman didn't get burnt by the rays of the sun. Just like some of you are sitting in the sun, and you'll probably get sunburn, even though the sun is so many millions of miles away. Hanuman was right next to the sun. But because of Vayu's grace, he was not getting burnt. But that particular day happened to be scheduled to be an eclipse. And Rahu was about to get the sun. And Hanuman saw Vayu, Rahu, so Hanuman chased after Rahu, <laughs> just kind of threw him away. Rahu was so disturbed, he went to Indra, he said, this is my appointed time, why are you, you, you have to protect me. So Indra got on Airavata, his elephant carrier, and charged out along with Rahu. And little baby Hanuman saw Airavata, massive elephant, and he wanted to play with him. So he jumped toward Airavata and grabbed him by the trunk and then jumped on his back to ride on him. And here Indra sitting on Airavata and little baby Hanuman's behind him. So Indra understood, I have to do something about this child. And Vayu said, no, he's my child, don't do anything. And Indra, so Indra sent his Vajra, his thunderbolt to hit the chin of this little baby child, Anjaneya. And the baby fell unconscious. Vayu saw that he was hardly breathing. So Vayu took the little baby in his arms and brought him to a cave. But in order to teach the devas a good lesson, he exerted his own powers. He had a higher purpose in mind, ultimately to bless his son. Vayu was in charge of the wind or the air. Nothing can survive without air. He withdrew all the air of the universe. Suddenly, all humans, all insects, all birds, all fish, all reptiles, all the demigods, they were suffocating. 
not only do we breathe air, but we can't move without air. Just like our joints, if there's not air within our joints, we can't move our arms or our fingers or even our eyes. So everything became paralyzed. And not only that, but without air, you can't digest food. You can't... <laughs> Neither you can digest it, nor can you remove it. So everyone became constipated. <laughs> everyone got incredible indigestion. Nobody could move and nobody could breathe. Power of Vayu. Where does he get his powers from? From Vishnu, from Krishna, from the Supreme. So all the devas on the verge of death and all the rishis and sages, they all approached Brahma and Brahma said, well, what do you expect? You caused harm to the son of Vayu. So all of the devas went to Vayu in the cave. And Brahma touched the little child. And for the first time, the little boy opened his eyes and he was fine. They all offered to give benedictions to the child. Now his name became Hanuman, which means one who was injured in his chin. Indra offered the benediction in order to atone for their offense to this little boy and to appease Vayu. All the great devas were giving their choicest benedictions to this child. But ultimately, it was because the child was the greatest of devotees, so that he could use all these benedictions in the loving service of Sri Ram. Indra promised that every one of your limbs will be stronger than my thunderbolt, my vajra, and nothing could harm you. Agni gave the benediction that fire could never cause you any pain or harm. Surya, the lord of the sun, offered the benediction that one hundredth of my effulgence you will have. And when you come of age, I will be your guru and teach you all knowledge of all subjects. Lord Brahma gave the benediction that nothing could kill you and no one could kill you. You will live as long as I live. Mahavishnu gave benediction, you will be the greatest of all great devotees. Kala gave him the benediction that even time will not be able to overcome you. So this little baby had so many benedictions. <laughs> then all the devas, they left and Bayu entrusted little Hanuman again to Anjana and Keshari and explained about all the benedictions that was given to him. So Hanuman was aware of all of them. So he became very mischievous as a little child. Because who could do anything to him? When all the demigods gave all their greatest powers to him. So sometimes, near the banks of the rivers and in the holy forest, the sages would be performing their tapasya, their worship, and Hanuman would come, and he would jump on their backs. He would go in the river when they were bathing and he would spit on them with the river water. Sometimes they would 
They would wear tree bark and they would hang it up after washing it and he would tear it to shreds. Other time he would jump in their scriptures. He was always causing very innocent but nice disturbances to them. <laughs> so they reported to Keshari and Anjan and they said, there's nothing we can do about it because he has all these benedictions. He doesn't listen to us. So they all came together to make a plan. And the plan was the sages were going to bless him with a curse <laughs> by the Lord's will that he will forget all his benedictions and think himself to be ordinary unless someone reminded him. So then he became such a well-mannered, helpful. He was carrying the water for the sages. And <laughs> helping to wash their clothes and dry them and doing everything nice. And none of them ever reminded Hanuman. <laughs> For many years, nobody reminded him. So we will continue our story tomorrow. Shri Hanuman Ji Ki Jai. I'd like to end with one small thought. In the coming narrations, we will hear about Hanuman's meeting with Ram and the incredible services he rendered to Ram in order to bring Sita back to Ram, he crossed over oceans. Hanuman represents pure devotional service, Bhakti. Our beloved Srila Prabhupada, our Guru, in order to bring the souls back to the lotus feet of Krishna or Ram, to restore that pure devotion, he also crossed many oceans. This is the principle of bhakti. It is expressed through compassion. Hanuman was the very embodiment of compassion to all beings. Our Guru Maharaj Srila Prabhupada, he represented that same compassion to all beings. for the body, the mind, and ultimately the soul. The highest compassion is to reunite the souls of others with the Supreme Soul. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he took the very essence of all Vedic knowledge Hadarnam, Hadarnam, Hadarnam Eva Kevalam. In this age of Kali, one can restore that love that is within our heart and reconnect us with the Supreme Personality of Godhead through the chanting of the holy names. Hanumanji, he was the personification of constant chanting of the holy names. Srila Prabhupada crossed oceans when he came to the Western world, kind of like Hanuman when he was in Sri Lanka. He was all alone. But he said, but I knew I had the blessings of my guru and I had the holy names of Krishna. So he had no fear. 
So we have come here to this very holy place to revive that love within our own hearts and to pray for the power to help revive that love within the hearts of others. Para upakar, the greatest compassion is to awaken that love for God within the hearts of others. To give people the understanding of their own true identity beyond birth and beyond death and beyond all suffering. And to give people the experience of the highest happiness. A happiness that is beyond all the inhibrities of this material existence. The taste of Krishna's love. And for that reason we have come to offer our prayers to serve one another. While on this pilgrimage we should perform some tapasya. If there are any inconveniences, take them as blessings. Trying to move around with over 4,500 people could be an inconvenience. But it's a blessing. Some inconvenience so that so many people could share the same opportunity as us should bring us joy. And while here on our pilgrimage, let us not discuss any gossip or mundane subjects. Let us really immerse ourselves in a prayerful mood, praying for pure devotion, eager to serve one another, Sam Siddhir Hari Toshinam. Lord Hari is especially pleased when we become the servant of the servant of his servants. So let us really try to live in that Vaikuntha consciousness. Actually, we should be like this for our whole life. But we can especially focus on it when we are here on pilgrimage. Because we don't have anything else to do. When we go home, we have so many duties and so many distractions, but here we have the opportunity to completely absorb ourselves. That's why we come. Absorb ourselves in chanting Krishna's names, Ram's names. Absorb ourselves in prayer in seva. We will end by having kirtan. Thank you very much.